Dear Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would move through this message today and apply the words to each individual here as they need to hear them. Lord, point out things in their own life where they may not be fully submitted and help them to hand over those areas to you, Lord, so that they can find peace and rest in full submission to you. In Jesus' name, amen. When looking over the choices of subject matter to preach on this Advent season, the topic of submission immediately stood out as one that I would like to address. Not because I have mastered the discipline of submission to the Lord, but rather just the opposite. I feel that I struggle with and against submission to the Lord maybe more than just about any other arena or discipline in my Christian walk. My hope today is that the very words I speak, mixed with the Holy Spirit's power, will actually sink deeper into my own life for conviction, comfort, encouragement, and ultimately transformation. And I hope that you're kind of blessed as well. To be honest, I think submission is the first necessary component to just about anything concerning God that we do. We first submit to the evidence, both physically and spiritually, that we are a sinner in need of salvation that cannot come from our own resources or efforts, past, present, or future. Before one can even admit that they need Jesus, they first have to submit to the evidence of it. Here, submission comes in the form of acceptance. We then submit to God's will for our lives daily and long term. We enroll into the kindergarten of listening, hearing, and obeying. And yes, it is kindergarten. No one starts this process in fourth grade, let alone high school, where you get to choose what you want to eat for lunch. As I prepared this sermon, I found that a clear definition as to what submission actually is, is elusive because submission looks so completely different depending on the context where it is being demanded of us. Moreover, it is an active ingredient in every single facet of our relationship with Christ. There is no situation in our walk with God where we are not the receiver. We are always the beneficiary of any interaction with God on any level at any time. However, because He is Lord, we may have to submit to sit out of a race that we know that we can win. We may have to submit to run a race that we know we will lose. We may have to submit to giving more than we can afford or when it hurts. We may have to submit to receiving more than we could ever pay back. And we will have to submit to situations and circumstances that we cannot control. The closest quick definition I can come up with concerning the word submission is relationship in relationship to God is acceptance with obedience. And your attitude is not optional because that would negate true acceptance. You are the dependent always. As I began my search for some good patriarchs or apostles with which to use as a reference for this sermon, I got lost in the sea of choices. I would have to reference just about everyone because I cannot think of one person who loved God in the Bible who wasn't submitting to the Lord in some way or fashion. So my reference is the whole Bible. I, literally, the whole book is the story of God trying to get His people to submit to his lordship, his love, his salvation, and his leading. We are going to mention some scriptures and specific people today. However, there is no one scripture that, is the mess that this message will be based around. But there is one that I want you to ruminate on. It is this, John 10, 27 through 28. This was Jesus speaking as the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. 
Every story in the Bible is ultimately a story of God working with his people to try and get them to see that he is for us and not against us, that he deeply desires us but does not need us, that we were far, far more in trouble due to our sin than we could understand, and that he wants to be known but cannot and will not be fully understood. That he is holy and that we are not, but we can be made holy. This sounds awesome. So what's the problem? Why do I and also you struggle so much with the idea and practice of submission to such a perfect, all-loving, all-knowing God whose desire is to bless us and to conform us into the image of his Son? Again, so what's our problem? Well, if we're going to use the whole Bible as a reference, then we better start in Genesis. God created the universe, and on the sixth day, he created man. When he created man, God made man in his image. There are 32 sermons that could be preached on that topic alone, but for the sake of time, let's reduce that to simply this. God desired worshipers who would worship in spirit and in truth, and he gave them free will. Why free will, you might ask? It's a good question. The answer is because God is love, and he desired people who would also freely love. You cannot have love without free will, because love demands free will in order for it to be truly love. You cannot have true love from a robot or a computer program, and you cannot have true love from a hostage. Simply put, there must be a choice. You cannot have true love without free will, which requires a choice not to love. Let's put it another way. If I want you to love Coca-Cola, then I cannot simply present you with a can of Coke only. There also has to be a choice for Pepsi or Sprite or, God forbid, Coke Zero. God, in giving us free will, presented Adam and Eve with choice to love or not love and to obey or not obey. We all know of how that ended up, but make no mistake, they were empowered with free will to freely choose, which is a necessity for love to exist. Now, moving on, what was the name of the tree that Adam and Eve ate the fruit of? when they exercised their free will and disobeyed God. It was the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Our American culture loves the word and the idea of knowledge. Knowledge is power. We pursue knowledge like it's intrinsically good. Say the word quietly to yourself, and you can catch yourself ascribing to it a whole list of healthy emotions. Sorry, I lost my place there. Healthy emotions like empowerment, freedom, choices, and self-discovery, whole grain, organic, free range, and homegrown. For effect, let me reword this for you. The fruit of the tree of the data of good and evil. How about now? Data doesn't nearly strike our emotions in the same way but it is essentially the same thing. You can use data to help your friend fix their car or their hot water heater, or you can use data to extort someone and enforce your will over them. We would say that a person has dirt on that other person, but what it really is, is knowledge. I think it important here to identify the difference between knowledge and wisdom because we so often confuse and intermingle the two. If not in our understanding, certainly in our actions. I'll make this quick so that everybody gets the point. Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is actually a fruit and not a vegetable. Wisdom is knowing that you don't put tomatoes in a fruit salad. Note that Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, not the tree of wisdom of good and evil. So what does all of this have to do with submission to God? Everything. We have free will and we have knowledge. We're like teenagers. <laughs> I'm going to pick on teenagers here a bit. 
If you haven't parented one yet, you can certainly remember being one and cringe a little. As you know, teenagers are notoriously a bit difficult because they have a tremendous amount of new knowledge flooding into them, along with new freedoms and responsibilities. As their capability grows, more of your money is finding its way into their pockets, and in their later years, they'll even start earning some of their own. More people are asking them for their help and resources, and maybe even their advice. They have more time and resources to pursue their own interests, and they've probably become really good at performing the duties demanded of them up to this point. So along with all of this new knowledge and capability, they suddenly discover their opinion. The problem is the same as, their problem is the same as ours. We think we know, but as life is always faithful to reveal, we don't know squat. Up until Adam and Eve sinned, they had always had free will, but they didn't feel the pressure of having to know stuff. That which they didn't know, they could simply ask about and then act accordingly. With disobedience came the gross reveal, the worst hangover in all of human history, and they realized that they didn't know anything and they were naked in their ignorance, and now separated from their source. Before then, ignorance wasn't an issue. Now, it most certainly was. They were separated from God, their source of all knowledge and wisdom and life, and they were going to die. When it comes to God and life, I like to capture God in a box, personally, and try to predict what He is doing with me, based upon what He has done with me before, with my friends, or those I read about in the Bible. In short, I think of God and life will deal with me according to patterns and formulas that I contrive. I'm very guilty of approaching God and life formulaically. Me doing so is like bringing my abacus and a speaking spell to Google headquarters and thinking that I'm going to contribute. As the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways above your ways, says the Lord. So to bring it back around, like teenagers with their parents, we withhold or resist submission to God in both heart and deed until we understand. Yet we also know that we understand probably less than 1% of the situation to begin with. And so starts the mental gymnastics. I know that I can't understand, but I won't submit until I do. And I will scream out questions like, Why? And Lord, I don't understand. And he quietly says back, I know. And then I say, so explain it to me. And he says, how could you, pass, how could you possibly factor the smell of the color nine? I can't do that, Lord. And he says, I know. Don't you recall my words to Job? But if you will trust me, and that's submission, and lean on me rather than your own understanding. I will give you peace and straighten your path. And church, peace is like oxygen. You don't fully appreciate it until you're without it. Another one of my favorite quotes is from Chuck Missler, where he says, A God small enough for us to comprehend would not be large enough for our need. A powerful memory that God reminds me of now and then is an event that happened to me uh, in high school along with a poor girl that was partnered with me. I was on a senior's retreat with about 40 other leaders from our class, and one of the exercises that they had us do that evening was to draw names from a hat and to get paired up with someone. We then had to blindfold them, stay behind them, and guide them throughout the retreat center using only our touch and our words. There were two levels and multiple flights of stairs that we had to navigate. I thought I skillfully led this girl around the joint, and it turned out to be not so bad. Then it was my turn. She blindfolded me and proceeded to try and encourage me to set out. I started walking, but was getting kind of annoyed that she was pushing so hard. After what seemed like a quick few minutes, it was uh, a quick few minutes, it was over, and I took off my blindfold. 
We took longer than anyone else and maybe double the amount of time. She looked like she had just run a marathon. She would have hit me, but the dripping sweat from her scalp was running down into her eyes and destroying her makeup. This poor girl was soaked to the bone, and she was angry. She called me a stubborn mule for the rest of the weekend. I didn't know that I was that hard to direct. God reminds me of this pretty, pretty regularly. How do I react when I cannot see? What is my trust level? I can say anything I want to about trusting her to lead me around the conference center. But when put to the test, the struggle revealed my level of trust in her and her disheveled condition revealed my level of submission to her leading. God reminds me of this all of the time as evidenced by my physical and emotional state when I am going through trials in my life. The only difference is that God doesn't take on the damage of my resistance to his leading. I do. Submission to Christ in anything and everything appears all throughout the Bible. The requirement for it is so common that it is almost like the call for salt in any cooking recipe. When you look at the list of ingredients, salt never stands out because it is so common. And it's almost assumed. However, we all have dishes that didn't turn out very tasty. And we all have circumstances where we fought the Lord for control in our lives. How did those go for you? Was it a smooth road? Did you have peace? I would like to narrow our focus for a bit and touch on a couple of facets of submission. Our first relevant topic is submission versus control. God loves you where you are, but he isn't going to leave you that way. It's his job to conform you to the image of his son because he loves you. As we all know, he chasteneth those whom he loveth. It is by his discipline that we know that we are sons. I believe that God is fully invested in taking our hands off of the wheel of our lives. For some, it is a season of hardship. For others, an extended season. And for some, it will be a lifelong process. That doesn't mean that the latter can't have a good, productive life. But it does mean that he's probably going to be, is probably going to experience a lot of befuddling and confounding that he has to deal with. I am one of those. God is very gracious with me, but more times than not, I find myself in opposition, not to the destination, but to who's driving and how fast or how slow he's allowing the camel or the Ferrari to go. As God is always faithful to do, he yet again had a big lesson in word for me this hunting season. This year, God's word to me was, let go. As many of you know, my personal finances this year have been extremely tight, much more so than I've had to deal with in the last 15 years. Of course, the main thing on my mind is, am I going to be able to secure the meat that we usually consume throughout a year in this fall hunting season? And the whole time God was whispering, let go. Just go have fun. Go and let me take care of the details. Let go. This year for elk season, I did things a bit differently. For starters, I was hunting alone with my muzzleloader in early October, and it's the first time I've done that. Also, I had loaned my truck and trailer to my friend to use for the hunting season up north as I took his truck that had a topper and went down south into the southeast corner of the state. Consequently, my friend didn't have to tow his trailer over here from Seattle, and he offered to pay for all of my gas. It was a win-win situation. While hunting, I met another fella that was also hunting alone, and we kind of hit it off and decided to hunt together. It was a great cooperative effort as he had a horse trailer converted into a cook shack, and that is where I prepared all of my meals and we had dinner together. It also rained for half of the time down there, so I got to prep my meals and to eat in relative dry conditions. In return, I hunted with him. 
And that way we watched each other's back. He's 64 years old and getting a 500 pound elk down, or worse yet, having an accident in the mountains is all, are always concerns that are in the back of your mind. On one particular day, I remember feeling so blessed that God had set the trip up this way. And in a moment of generosity, I said, hey, if I get an elk, but you don't, I'll split mine with you. And he liked the idea and also agreed to the same. Well, it turns out I did shoot one the next day, and that was the only elk we got. In fact, it was the only elk that anyone got in the area out of five camps and about 20 people. After we got it out, we had to talk about how to process it. I usually take just the fine cuts and then grind the rest into burger, which is what my household usually eats the most. However, he does his own butchering, and he wanted all kinds of different cuts from his side of the elk. Well, it made the most sense for him to take all of it, handling the butchering on his own, and I could pick up my burger and fine cuts the next time I was over in Olympia, which is where he's from. I didn't like it, but it did make the most sense. That night, while laying in my sleeping bag, I couldn't get to sleep because I didn't like the idea of this fella taking my elk home. In my conversation with the Lord, I was saying, I don't like this. And he said, let go. Well, what if he screws me and takes more than his share? And I felt like God was smiling and saying, yeah. <laughs> what if he does? Son, would you give him the whole elk if I asked you to? Of course, Lord, you know I would. Then let go. Where is the problem with this story? Am I generous enough and have faith enough in God to give away a whole elk? Yes. Then why was I so upset? Because the situation made me dependent on another fella's honesty, and I wasn't able to control the details. I wasn't the one handling the butchering and the details of the distribution. That bothered me. But I would have given the whole thing away if the Lord had asked me to. I was more bothered by having a partial stake in an animal with no control than I was in having no control if I gave the whole thing away. The Lord had to remind me repeatedly that, I, that he had set the whole hunt up from the beginning and that I would simply enjoy it more if I would let go. The Apostle Paul had to address this same mentality over and over again concerning living by the law versus living by faith and receiving God's grace. We as people both now and back then would rather fail at keeping the law, which we understand, than to succeed at living by faith. Why? Because with the law, we think we understand the rules. We could comprehend them, which gives us an illusion of control. If failing, we could simply try harder. Our sinful flesh, in its ignorance, would rather lose a game with a visual scoreboard and rules that we understand than to follow a coach that says he's already won and we simply need to follow him and do what he says, but refuses to tell us where we're going or what he's up to. Submission and Affliction If God is going to refine you in the furnace of affliction, you cannot stop him, you cannot speed it up, you cannot cut it short, and you cannot escape. He loves you too much to let you do that. However, you do have a choice as to how you're going to respond to it. Should you choose to fight, the fire will get hotter, and the blasts from the fluxing situations that he allows will grow more intense, and you will be miserable. Real quick, everyone understands the metaphor of heat to melt and refine metal. It directly, it directly translates into pressure in our lives as we are refined. And how many different times in the Bible does God state that he refines us so that we are like pure gold and precious silver, refined over and over until pure, and he can see his reflection in the pool? The truth is simply this. God does not pleasure in our suffering, but he greatly pleasures 
in what suffering produces when he is at the wheel. The truth is there are some lessons, some refinement, some attributes that simply cannot be achieved without suffering, and for some, long seasons of it. Boy, we sure don't like hearing that in our microwave, drive through Uber Eats life and culture. Let's take a quick look at Joseph in the Bible. Joseph was Jacob's favorite son, the only son up to that point of Jacob's favorite wife. Joseph was given lots of gifts by his father, including a technicolor dream coat. He was also given two dreams by God. Eleven stars were bowing down to his star, and eleven sheaves were bowing down to his sheaf. When given this, he rushed off to tell his brothers. Now, I don't think Joseph was a scoundrel or meant to hold it over them like they accused him of. But at the very least, he was ignorant of the pain that his father's favoritism was causing his other brothers. I think Joseph was truly oblivious to the pain that his brothers were enduring. Fast forward. We'll go through this quick because you all know the story. Joseph was beaten and nearly killed. How terrifying and sobering that must have been. If he was ignorant before, he certainly wasn't now. Rather than be killed, they sold him into a lifetime of slavery. He spent the next 11 years in Potiphar's house, working as a slave, but working diligently. Potiphar's wife took an interest, was rejected, and falsely accused him of rape. He graduated from slavery to full-blown prison. He worked diligently again in prison and was made a steward of the prison. He interpreted some dreams and instructed Pharaoh's cupbearer to lobby for him once released. Two years go by, the cupbearer probably forgot about him until Pharaoh himself had two very troubling dreams. And the cupbearer suddenly remembers Joseph, and jo Joseph is called upon. Let's pick up the story there and read the scripture. And we're coming in right after Joseph has just interpreted Pharaoh's two dreams. Genesis 41:32. <clears throat> the reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God, and God will do it soon. And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. When Joseph stated this to Pharaoh, I don't think he was expecting anything more than a warm bath and a hot meal, both which would have been necessary before one would have come before Pharaoh. Notice what was absent? Personal ambition or the attempt to seize the opportunity to better his own position. In 13 years of hardship, I think suffering had completed its task. Let's look at Psalm 105, verses 17 through 19. And God sent a man before them, Joseph, sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with shackles. His neck was put in irons. Until what he foretold came to pass, until the word of the Lord proved him true. I believe Joseph was as shocked as we are to learn that God skipped the whole corporate ladder and promoted Joseph through Pharaoh to second in all of Egypt. Joseph didn't skip the ladder. He just skipped the corporate ladder of achievement and rather was put on God's ladder of suffering and character refinement. Submission to God at this point wasn't so much a choice as it was a place that he was brought to. And in the matter of one decree, Joseph was set free from prison and given wealth, power, influence, and luxury accommodations. Hebrews 12, 7 through 11 reads, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God's disciplines, God disciplines us for our good, 
in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. One of my favorite prayers in all of the Bible comes from Hezekiah after he fell ill, was ill for an undetermined amount of time, but I've, my own personal thought is that he was ill for quite a while and that it was quite a grievous illness. And then after a time, he was healed. This appears in Isaiah 38, and it's verses 10 through 19. I said, in the prime of my life, must I go through the gates of death and be robbed of the rest of my years? I said, I will not again see the Lord himself in the land of the living. No longer will I look on my fellow man or be with those who now dwell in this world. Like a shepherd's tent, my house has been pulled down and taken from me. Like a weaver, I have rolled up my life and he has cut me off from the loom. Day and night, you made an end of me. I waited patiently till dawn, but like a lion, he broke all of my bones. Day and night, you made an end of me. I cried like a swift or thrush. I moaned like a morning dove. My eyes grew weak as I looked to the heavens. I am being threatened. Lord, come to my aid. But what can I say? He has spoken to me, and he himself has done this. I will walk humbly all of my years because of this anguish of my soul. Lord, by, su by such things people live, and my spirit finds life in them too. You restored me to health, and you let me live. Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. In your love, you kept me from the pit of destruction. You have put all of my sins behind your back. For the grave cannot praise you. Death cannot sing your praise. Those who go down to the pit cannot hope for your faithfulness. The living, the living, they praise you as I am doing today. Parents tell their children about your faithfulness. I don't believe that we suffer one second beyond what is required for God to refine us and to bring out his likeness in us. However, I also do not think we have any concept as to how deep the problem goes or how long or intense the refinement necessary to root it out. Submission to God's timing. It has been said that of all things concerning God, we Christians struggle the most with God's timing and God's justice. We don't have time today to talk about God's justice as it is a subject all its own, but let's take a brief glimpse at some of God's timing. You're in good company if you struggle with the crucible of time and waiting on God to move on your behalf in some way. Abraham endured 25 years for the promise of Isaac to come to pass. However, not before he fudged the situation on numerous occasions, including siring Ishmael. We already spoke about Joseph, 13 years in between his dreams and their reality, with gut-wrenching pain and disappointment in between. David waited 14 years in between the time he was anointed king and actually took the throne. He went from shepherd to chosen to servant to hero to outlaw and fugitive while homeless before becoming king. Moses waited 40 years in between learning who he was and actually going back to Egypt. Moreover, he spent those 40 years as a shepherd. Let us remember that Moses was educated in the palace of Pharaoh, which would be the finest education available to anyone in that day. Even though he chose to identify with the Israel, uh, yeah, even though he chose to identify with the Israelites, he probably still had some cultural judgments that needed to die out 
because he was made a shepherd. For those 40 years, he was shepherding. We know from Genesis 46, 34, that all shepherds were an abomination to Egyptians. You shall say, your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth. Until now, both we and our fathers, in order that you may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. So psychologically, what is your worst job? What's the lowest you would go? Talk about a career setback. Yet even though highly educated and competent, when the Lord approached him 40 years later after becoming a shepherd, Moses claimed that he was just an old man with a stick and a stutter. Slow in speech, his pride was dust, and any fantasies of being Israel's deliverer had died out. He was in the perfect spot. Remember that God does not call the qualified, but rather he qualifies the called. Jesus waited 30 years before he was anointed to start his public ministry. How, mu how, how much frustration must that have produced? Knowing you're the savior of all humanity who desperately needs your wisdom, but hey, pass me some nails so that we can frame this house. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, and in due time he shall raise you up. That's 1 Peter 5, 6. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. That's Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11. And we know that all things work together for the good of those that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. That's Romans 8, verse 28. I truly believe that submission, humility, contentment, and peace are all part of the same package of blessing that the Lord is absolutely committed to giving us. However, like most things, we need to grow into them. We need to struggle with them, and we need to plead with God to show us how they work. As we have seen, submission is both something we can choose and a place we arrive at, usually without us even knowing it. It's kind of elusive in the same way that humility is. Humility is not thinking about yourself last. Humility is not thinking about yourself at all. I'll wrap this up by telling one last quick story. When I was living in Montana, I got the privilege of having five beautiful, uninterrupted hours driving my pastor at the time home from Whitefish to Bozeman, which is where we lived. I had prepared a very long list of questions that I was seeking answers to, by which I would get answers and then formulate a whole new arsenal of formulas by which I would then live. As we drove, I talked, I questioned, I cross-examined, and to better than 50% of my questions, his answer was, I don't know. I didn't know. I still don't know. I may never know. By the time we got to Bozeman, I couldn't tell if I was more exhausted, angry, or disappointed. I most certainly was all three for sure. That continued to bother me for the longest time as I thought he was dodging my questions, or like a Jedi, was setting me up to learn for myself. Eighteen years have passed since that car ride. I get it now. I thought he was the wisest man back then. Now I see that he indeed was wise, but when he spoke, he would only speak what God would give him, would, would, he would only speak when God would give him stuff to say. But when God didn't say anything, he simply said he didn't know, and he was totally okay and at peace with that. I want to get there too. There is tremendous freedom to be found in being fully submitted to Christ and not knowing or understanding what is going on. You don't have to because you know that Christ is behind the wheel and he knows what he's doing. When we are submitted to Christ, we get those things back that we lost in the garden. We get life and wisdom and knowledge and peace 
as we get freedom of the pressure of having to know. I want to end this sermon with verse 3 of Blessed Assurance. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness and lost in his love. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, please help us get to and to choose full submission to your lordship and your leading and your love. Help us to listen and obey the voice of your Holy Spirit guiding us and directing us and navigating us through this life which we only understand in part, but you understand fully. Lord, help us to set aside our judgments and what we think we know and to follow your voice as you lead us. You are the good shepherd and we do know your voice. Lord, Lord, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ as we follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.